So as a brief introduction to parasitology, we've already sort of defined parasitology as the study of parasites. Let's take a look and, and, and highlight um, you know, why this is an important branch of science, all right? We're looking at a branch of science that studies parasitic organisms, those that uh, require a host, okay? That's the definitive uh, characteristic of a parasite. These are organisms that cannot su survive independently of an, as an organism host. Um, in this course, we will focus on parasitic diseases of humans that are caused by three different types of organisms, protozoa, helmets, and arthropods. So we'll characterize these as parasites and look into a little bit more detail about how they um, cause human disease. All right, and we and we won't only focus on human disease. We're also concerned with um, animal diseases as well. All right. So what is parasitism? All right. Parasitism is de de uh, generally defined as the uh, association between a host and a parasite. All right. So throughout this course, we'll take a look at several uh, organisms and animals that can um, serve as a host for a parasite. All right. There are different organisms that uh, inhabit very specific hosts. All right. So we're going to take a look at some of those associations this semester. I wanted to start with just some basic terminology that you'll see uh, throughout this course. Uh, one of them being the endo and ectoparasites, right? Very generally speaking, we can define a parasite as an endo or ectoparasite, right? Endoparasites are those that are gonna live inside of the host, right? Some of the very characteristic symptoms of a endoparasitic infection is gonna be like intestinal discomfort, diarrhea, weight loss and things of that nature. And those are those are uh, clinical symptoms of like, say a tapeworm infection, okay? So endoparasites, as the name suggests, if you're looking at that prefix endo, uh, we're talking about organisms that in, live inside of the host, okay? Um, on the other hand, we have ectoparasites, all right? Ectoparasites are those that live outside of the host, all right? So we're seeing manifestations of lesions, uh, itchiness, infections, okay? These are obligatory or facultative, but you see them like, for example, in the tick, okay? They can harbor uh, parasitic organisms, and we'll go into a little bit more detail about that. But we have endo and ectoparasites as our uh, sort of broad classification of parasitic organisms, all right? So let's look at some other terminology that you'll see repeatedly. Jot a few of these down. Parasites, by definition, we're saying organisms that require or live off of other organisms to derive their sustenance. What they need to survive, they cannot uh, survive without living on or in another organism, okay? That is a parasite. Uh, a vector is an agent that carries or transmits a, a an infectious pathogen to another living organism right so we see a lot of um literature about vectors and parasitology because a lot of uh organisms that cause both human and animal diseases require vectors in order to transmit right so for example the mosquito as a vector a vehicle that's going to transmit that malaria parasite from one person to the next okay so our vectors uh, carry these infectious pathogens into another organism, okay? Our host, right? The host is the organism that harbors a parasite, all right? So the host is that which will be infected with the parasitic organism. So we say that they harbor parasites, all right? Parasites live inside of or on our host, all right? So you should definitely be able to provide these uh, basic definitions of what is a parasite, what is a vector. When you're out reading, when you're out writing, you're using these terms in context, okay? What questions do you have about this information? Any questions? I have no question. Okay. 
So parasitic infections, parasites are, uh, parasitic infections are a large problem in mostly, pretty much anywhere, but they're really problematic in tropical and subtropical regions. Um, they also do um, occur in developed countries, including the U.S. There are a few uh, represented parasitic representative uh, parasitic diseases in the U.S. that we'll take a look at today. Go ahead and jot these down. Trichomoniasis, giardiasis, cryptosporidiosis, and toxoplasmosis. You've probably heard of at least two of these four um, diseases, all right? They are caused by parasites, all right? So if we were to go and look at some global representation of parasitic diseases throughout the world, these are ones that are uh, representative of the U.S., all right? There are other parasitic infections that, again, are, are very common to other regions and so forth, but let's take a look at some of the ones that are representative of those that we deal with here in the U.S. So trichomoniasis um, is a, a sexually transmitted disease. Giardiasis is a stomach or intestinal disease. Cryptosporidiosis Cryptospor also we're going to see through transmission through swimming pools and so forth and toxoplasmosis. Let's take a look at those. So uh, trichomoniasis is sometimes referred to as trick. It's a very common STD here in the U.S. All right. It's caused by an infection with a protozoan parasite. All right. Protozoan parasite Trichomonas vaginalis. Write that down. I do want you to be able to characterize some of these diseases and their uh, causative uh, parasitic agents. Okay, you do need to be able to define what type of a, a parasitic organism um, the organ the agent is. In this case, uh, Trichomoniasis is caused by a protozoan parasite. All right, so I told you there's three types. We have our helminths, our protozoans, and our Crustaceans, helmets, protozoans, and crustaceans, yes. So we have protozoan parasites here. They, uh, the infection is commonly found in the lower genital tract in women and inside the male penis, okay? So if we were attempting to isolate this organism, this is where we probably would be able to um, do so. This infection, unfortunately, is 70% asymptomatic. What does that mean? You won't have symptoms. Right. An individual can be uh, infected and not know it. So what does that mean? <laughs> Why is that a problem? Because they can pass it. And Absolutely. Absolutely. That increases the likelihood that you're passing it on to your uh, sexual partners if you do not know that you are infected and you don't uh, use protection, all right? 70% asymptomatic, but if we were to uh, clinically uh, describe symptoms, we would see some form of vaginal or, or genital uh, discomfort, irritation, severe inflammation. Um, if we were to look at a micrograph of this organism and what it looks like under the microscope, we have an image over here on the right. I'm not necessarily gonna require you to be able to identify pictures per se, but this is just to kind of give you an idea of what this organism looks like structurally. Um, there is a document that I uh, provided for you guys in your Blackboard course uh, that you can use as an additional resource or textbook for further investigating these things that we talk about in class. And hopefully you had a chance to look at those. All right, so that's trichomoniasis, right? So this is a very common uh, parasitic disease that we deal with here in the U.S. Giardiasis, this is a diarrheal disease, all right? It's caused by giardia species, all right? It's going to be found in the intestines um, and passed out in feces, all right? So if we wanted to try and isolate the presence of a uh, giardia pa a parasite, we're going to try to get a stool sample, okay? Um, giard giardia is transmitted from surfaces. It can be transmitted in contaminated water. Uh, we can, it can be transmitted in undercooked infected meats, okay? So we'll talk a little bit more in details about ways to prevent the transmission of parasites, especially in our foods, cooking our foods to proper temperatures, all right? So symptoms of this type of uh, giardiasis is diarrhea, flatulence, upset stomach, all right? So you're going to feel these symptoms right away, all right? This is a uh, image of what this Giardia species looks like under the microscope, very characteristic. Um, again, as you continue to move throughout this uh, semester, you're gonna become familiar with what some of these parasites look like under the microscope. 
but this is a Giardia species and you will learn to um, identify them as we go on. So again, this is a diarrheal disease. So we have an STD, we have this diarrheal disease, again, that's transmitted between uh, surfaces, not cleaning properly, improper sanitation, con consuming or ingesting contaminated water, um, consuming undercooked infected meats, all right? So I do, I would like for you to be able to, you know, on surface, um, identify with what these diseases are and, and their manifestations, okay? Cryptosporidiosis, all right? This is disease that causes, again, like a watery diarrhea. It's caused by a protozoan pathogen, cryptosporidium. It's going to live in the, in the intestines of infected people. It's passed out also through feces. Symptoms, again, are going to be uh, just like intestinal discomfort, diarrhea, stomach cramps, vomiting, okay? It's a pretty gross <laughs> organism. It's also a, a protozoan pathogen. And toxoplasmosis. This is what we would consider an opportunistic infection. What are opportunistic infections and why are they important? Somebody, what is an opportunistic infection? I'm not sure. Anybody else know? Mr. Nero, do you know what is an opportunistic infection? Yes, ma'am. What is an opportunistic infection? They are those infections that take advantage of the organisms. <laughs> right. So in this case, a, an opportunistic infection is one that it, it sort of manifests itself as a secondary infection and it's uh, seen in individuals with compromised immune systems. Okay. Make a note of this. Opportunistic infections are those that if you are a healthy host, for the most part, if you're infected with something like Toxoplasma gundi, you probably won't be too sick. You might have some very mild symptoms, okay? But you mostly would see uh, more severe uh, symptoms of this if you are immune compromised, okay? So opportunistic infections typically would not cause, are, are caused or would not be clinically Organisms that cause opportunistic infections typically do not cause infections in a healthy host, okay? Humans become infected with uh, Toxoplasma gundi by ingesting the eggs, okay, uh, in undercooked infected meat, okay? Did you, did you say autoimmune? No, uh, immune compromised. Immune compromised, okay. Yes. So if you are immune compromised in any way, um, you're most likely to present symptoms of an, of, an, of an opportunistic infection, whereas like a healthy person would be able to clear that infection pretty easily without too many symptoms, okay? And so uh, humans, again, are infected by ingesting the eggs, all right? That these eggs are gonna be released in uh, cat feces, all right? If we consume undercooked infected meat, then we run the risk of uh, ingesting these eggs, okay? Toxoplasma gundi, write that one down. That's a pretty common uh, representative uh, parasitic organism here in the U.S., okay? Symptoms are going to be that of the flu, you know, soreness, achy, you may have some fever, okay? This is what the uh, Toxoplasma gundi looks like underneath the microscope. All right. And so the point I was making earlier is that uh, these uh, parasitic infections are common in many, many different regions across the U.S. Certain regions are known for their representative, representative parasitic infections, and we'll continue to um, flush out some of those throughout this semester. So does anyone want to take a stab at what is the most deadly parasitic infection globally? Excuse me. What is the most deadly parasitic uh, disease that we deal with on a global scale? Like causing the most deaths? Malaria. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Malaria infection. All right. We'll definitely spend some time looking at this um, malaria infection. All right. And so what's happening here, we talked about that vector. All right. So we have a person that is infected with the malaria parasites and it's basically going to be uh, in your blood. All right. You got infected liver cells, infected red blood cells. You are attacked by a mosquito. Mosquito comes and take the, the blood meal. And this mosquito is going to take up the uh, malaria parasite as he's taking the blood meal. Okay, and this mosquito will serve as our what in this transmission cycle? What do we call the mosquito in this infection cycle? What term did we just uh, learn? For... What is it, Miss Story? <laughs> um, is it the opportunistic? Um... Mm -mm. Oh. Is it a vector? It's our vector, okay? Oh, okay. Mosquitoes right. are vectors in this kind of a, um, infection, okay? It's transmitting this plasmodium, this uh, malaria parasite from one person to the next by way of the mosquito, all right? So we'll take a dive more, you'll dive a little bit deeper into this malaria infection, but just for a point of us having our kind of overview discussion today, I do want you to know that the malaria infection is the most deadly parasitic infection worldwide okay so let's look at some ways in which parasitic infections are transmitted so we just identified one somebody recap that one for me what's one way that we know parasitic infections can be transmitted and the word transmitted means carried from one person to the next how can that happen we just looked at one one way How can parasitic infections be transmitted? Uh, <laughs> we, we just looked at one, the last disease that we just looked at. Just um, through mosquito bite? Through the mosquito bite, right? So through that of a vector, right? Transmission of parasitic infections. Let's jot a few of these down. Fecal oral route, all right? You're going to see this a lot. A lot of parasitic infections are due to fecal oral contamination. That means that we are ingesting contaminated food or water. Right. This happens for a number of reasons, many to be explained, some we don't really understand, but I mean, when you consider underdeveloped countries where there's poor sanitation, poor hygiene, there's an increased likelihood that there's going to be some contamination of food and water. All right. You don't cook your foods to the proper temperature. Now you're ingesting these undercooked, uh, contaminated meats. All right. We have uh, contaminated water. All right. You have people that you know, again, in underdeveloped countries where they have to interact with their environments a lot. So they're drinking water from a stream. They're washing their clothes in a stream, all right? Somehow or another, we're ingesting these uh, contaminated foods and waters. That's a fecal oral route of transmission, all right? You do need to be able to describe for me modes of transmission of parasitic infections, okay? So fecal oral route, you're gonna see that a lot. Whenever you see that, just think in terms of the parasite is basically released in a stool sample in feces and it's into the environment and somehow or another we're going to end up ingesting it. Does that make sense? The organism is released in the feces of whatever the host is that's harboring the parasite. Um, cats, humans, dogs, depending on what the host is, when the feces is released, defecation happens, organisms are released, somehow or another it may, makes its way into our food and water supply and we ingest it. That is a fecal oral route of transmission, okay? Arthropod vectors. This is another very common route of transmission for parasitic infections, okay? So we're talking about through the bite of a mosquito or a sand fly, okay? That's what's being represented here. All right, these organisms are gonna come and take a blood meal and they're going to ingest this parasitic organism that's perhaps in the bloodstream of the host, okay? So what we saw with our uh, malaria infection, okay? Those Anopheles mosquitoes are coming to take a blood meal and the person that's infected is, th they have this uh, malaria parasite in their bloodstream. 
And so when the mosquito comes and takes a bite, he's gonna take up that blood, that uh, parasite. And then when he goes and uh, takes a bite of the second person for the second blood meal, he's gonna release that parasite into the second person. So arthropod vectors, all right? Mosquitoes, sand flies, and, and the like, okay? Sexual contact, okay? That's pretty self-explanatory. Yes, parasitic organisms can be transmitted sexually. We just saw the example with our trichomoniasis, okay? That's a sexually transmitted infection. That's a parasitic infection that's caused by or transmitted through sexual contact. That organism can be isolated from the human genital areas. So, Again, we're just kind of giving you some overview of things that you're going to continue to explore this semester. So we, we're, we looked at some terminology. We looked at some of these sort of representative parasitic infections in the U.S. And we looked at some modes of transmission. Okay, make sure you've jotted these down. Next, let's look at how we can diagnose parasitic diseases. Okay, um, mostly uh, we're looking at stool samples, okay, blood tests, all right? So diagnosis of parasitic diseases, uh, we can do fecal exam where again, we collect the stool sample and we examine it for the eggs, for evidence of the eggs or the actual parasite, all right? Uh, when we get to our talk about the life cycle of these uh, parasites, we'll see that they have uh, developmental stages, right? And so the ova, the ova, or the egg is one of the stages of development that may be present uh, in the host that can be isolated for identification of the actual organism, right? But we can also, we might also be able to find evidence of the actual parasite and not just uh, the eggs, right? Um, so fecal exam, endoscopy, colonoscopy. So again, we're putting these tubes into various canals and um, taking pictures, right? Um, blood tests. These are where we're using serology or some type of a blood smear in order to look for the presence of antibody or antigens that are characteristic of a parasitic infection. Or on a blood smear, we're looking under the microscope again for the presence of this parasite. All right. So I showed you a couple of micrographs of our Giardia and uh, I think Trichomoniasis. And so we can look um, and see if we see the actual uh, parasitic organism present uh, from a blood smear, right? Uh, X-rays, we can look for uh, lesions and organs and so forth. There are some parasites that uh, causes like organ damage and lesions and so forth. And so we can use that as a, a tool to try and diagnose a, the presence of a parasitic disease, all right? So jot these down, some ways in which we can diagnose parasitic diseases, fecal samples, endoscopy, uh, blood test, x-rays. You should be able to understand these and how they are useful tools, okay? Don't just list them, but be able to tell me how does a fecal exam assist us in uh, identifying and diagnosing a parasitic disease? Any questions? Any questions? No, oh, ma'am. And again, remember here, we're, this discussion is providing you with a, a sort of a framework, all right? I'm a facilitator of learning, so I'm providing you with this framework. I do admonish you to go out, read, use additional sources, the World Wide Web, YouTube, any other resource to further uh, explore these topics that we're covering in class so that you have a clear understanding. So we talked briefly about the classes of parasites. Let's look at them again. We're gonna look at some protozoan parasites in this class, the helminths, and then some arthropods, all right? Uh, protozoan parasites, these are some characteristics that you should already know from your microbiology class and biology and so forth. These protozoa, these are single-celled eukaryotic organisms, right? So that's gonna include our amoeba, ciliates, flagellates, all right? These are all gonna be able to be distinguished uh, from a physiological standpoint or, or or physical standpoint, uh, looking for structure and so forth um, for these protozoan parasites, right? 
Our helminths, these are our endoparasites. They are multicellular eukaryotic organisms. So these are the worms, all right? These worms are very problematic um, for humans, all right? So there are different types of worms that cause human infection as well as animals or cattle, right? Brown worms, flat worms, flukes, we're gonna go through all of those, all right? Arthropods, all right? So these arthropods, uh, serve as vectors, or they can be the parasites themselves. Ectoparasites, we know they're going to live outside of the host. They are important in parasitology because they function as vectors, all right? So we have crustaceans, arachnids, and insects. We're going to characterize them all this semester, all right? So I should, I, 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 my goal here is to give you an overview of the things that we're going to explore this semester. All right, so we're definitely going to categorize our parasites as either protozoa, helminths, and arthropods. You should definitely be able to sort of describe the characteristics of these various classes, you know, distinguishing between, you know, eukaryotic or prokaryotic. Are they multicellular or single, single cellular? Can you identify images or structures that represent these various classes? Okay, you should be able to do that. All right. And again, we don't, this class, you know, it's an, learning is sort of ongoing and nothing, nothing is fan, finite, but I do, uh, you are going to be expected to have some basic competencies when you leave this class. You're not expected to be an expert, but you should certainly, you know, be able to have an intelligent uh, conversation about these things. So uh, let's take a look at some of the host parasite interactions that you should uh, be familiar with. Right. So we said that the parasite is the organism that requires a host to survive. So it's living on or in the uh, host. Right. So the host is the organism on or in which a parasite lives. Right. So there are some relationships that can occur between host and parasites. OK. Uh, the host is the harboring organism of a parasite and it can fall into three different types of hosts. Let's look at them. Some types, what are some types of parasitic hosts, all right? There's what we call a definitive host, an intermediate host, and then a peritonic host, which we'll sometimes call a, a reservoir host, all right? Definitive hosts are, the, are the, jot these down. You, you do need to be familiar with these uh, definitions and, and distinguishing the type of host in terms of how they function in the life cycle of the parasite. The definitive host, as the name probably suggests to you, um, is the host that is required for the parasitic organism to fully develop, for critical stages of development for the parasite, okay? Um, to become a true adult, sexually uh, reproduct, uh, sexually reproductive uh, features uh, occurs. That sexual development, mature development occurs in our definitive host. Okay. The intermediate host, as the name suggests, again, it's one that sort of harbors this parasite during a sort of non, I won't say non-essential, but non, um, what word, non immature, immature stages of development. This organism has not fully matured, okay? Peritonic host, excuse me, our, our reservoir hosts are just those that can uh, harbor the organism. Not a whole lot is going on, but it can transmit uh, this organism, this parasitic organism, okay? So definitive host, those, the host in which a parasite reaches sexual maturity and can reproduce, okay? So it's fully mature, it can reproduce, it can multiply, uh, in this case, definitive hosts are mostly vertebrates, right? So we're looking at animals like humans, pigs, rodents, etc. Uh, serve as definitive hosts for a number of parasitic organisms. Okay, 
you will be responsible for identifying the definitive host for some of the parasitic uh, agents that we'll go into discussion about this semester. All right, so we talked about the malaria infection, okay? Malaria infection is caused by uh, plasmodium species. So the Anopheles mosquito is a definitive host for plasmodium vivax, okay? So this organism has to go through developmental stages in this Anopheles mosquito and then it's further uh, transmitted to the human host. We'll see this sort of two-part uh, life cycle for uh, malaria infection. It's sort of unique. We'll take a look at that in this class. So our intermediate host is where uh, asexual development of the parasite occurs, right? So it's sort of in, in, a, in an immature stage of development. No reproduction is taking place here. So the organism can exist in this host, but it's not reproducing, okay? Um, for plasmodium vivax, which again is a infection, is one of the etiological agents of malaria, the intermediate host is the man, human. Okay, so this is a pretty unique infection in that it requires two hosts in order to complete its life cycle. All right, so we have intermediate hosts, we have a definitive host, and then we have our peritonic host, also known as sort of a carrier, <coughs> right? A transport host, okay? There's no development going on in this host, right? It just continues to uh, exist as a parasite on this host. It can live in, it can affect it, it may or may not affect it. We'll look at some ways in which, we'll look at some types of parasitic infections in just a moment. They're not all harmful, right? Um, so peritoneal host, again, it's just a host that's harboring the parasitic agent but there's no uh, parasitic development happening in a peritoneal host. This reservoir host, again, I kind of mentioned it earlier, is sort of known as a temporary host. It can harbor the parasite without many effects, okay? It does become a source of infection to the definitive host, so it's one way by which the definitive host can come in contact with the parasite. Um, this reservoir host is not essential for a parasite to complete its life cycle, right? So like the monkey, for example, is a reservoir host for plasmodium, right? So the monkey can harbor it, but there's not much going on, all right, with uh, the plasmodium in terms of uh, developmental stages and uh, sexual maturity, reproduction, and so forth. All right. Um, vector host. All right. These are hosts in which a part of the life cycle of the parasite takes place and is also instrumental in the actual transmission of the parasite from main host to uh, another. All right. These are mostly going to be our arthropods. All right. So um, the mosquitoes, the sand flies, you know, flies and so forth are serving as vector host. All right. Uh, the Anopheles mosquito is one. All right, so this is just some life, uh, life cycle overviews of um, parasitic infections, okay? So for this, in this case, the definitive host, which I said earlier is usually uh, a vertebrae, this is like a human or in this case, the cat, all right? The cat serves as a definitive host. The mouse is an intermediate host of a particular uh, microorganism or parasitic agent, okay? Um, the cat is going to come in contact with this mouse and become infected. It will, the parasitic organism will undergo life cycle stages of development and the cyst can be released in the feces, all right? Somehow or another humans become in contact with these uh, oocysts and can serve as a um, intermediate host, okay? The organisms can persist 
in other animals without causing any problems. So we'll continue, we will look at some more uh, life cycle uh, processes of varia, varying uh, parasitic infections as we move through this course. Uh, the goal of today was to sort of provide some overview of some terminology and, and relationships that we will see uh, throughout this course, all right? So I'm gonna stop here for today. We do have an extension assignment I think this is gonna be your first definitive. Um, oh, I forgot to push record. Oh, no, I didn't.